Hello, I'm Anna Mackay, and in this video series, we've got three parts to this. We're going to be solving quadratics. This table here that you can see is just a bit of a reminder of the different polynomial functions that you can have, and quadratics are where x is to power 2. So let's go on and solve some of these. Just a bit of a refresher first, though. So the values of x that satisfy an equation like this, what are they called? So we're saying, what is the name of the value that you could substitute in here for x so that this whole left-hand side of the equation equals the right-hand side, equals 0? What would they be called? They'd be called the roots or the solutions to that equation. So how do we find these? Some traditional methods are using the null factor law. So for this video, I'm assuming you've actually already done a bit of factorizing and solving. Um, otherwise, this video might assume a little bit too much knowledge for you. And so that law is this, where if you have two numbers that are multiplied together and give you zero, what could those numbers be? For example, if A and B were three and four, well, that multiplies to give you 12, so that can't give you zero. What would A or B have to be? One of them at least has to be zero because any number multiplied by zero gives you zero. So you could have zero and four or three and zero. And so that's how the null factor law works, that A equals zero or B equals zero. Then the quadratic formula here, which I'm assuming you've done before, but we'll recap in the next video. Completing the square is another technique and using technology. So your graphics calculators using either um, the equation menus to solve, sim um, to solve equations um, in solver or graphing and looking for the roots or the x-intercepts. But for this one, we're using factorization. So I'd love you to be writing these examples down and doing them with me. So the first step whenever we do factorization is always look for a common factor. And in this first one, we have one, which is x. So we're going to factorize that out and writing what's left over in each term. So when we factorize out an x here, we're left with a 3x in the first term and a 5 in the second term, all equal to 0. And here's where the null factor law kicks in. There's two things multiplied together now, and therefore one or both has to be 0. And so therefore we, we would write, therefore, x is equal to 0 or 3x plus 5 is equal to 0, and let's keep solving for x. Well, the first one is solved, and then doing some rearranging here. Now, at this level of maths, you don't necessarily have to show every step of the way. You could have gone from this first line down to this last line here. That's fine to do that much rearranging. Solving for x, x is 0 or negative 5 on 3. Second one here. So to be able to use the null factor law, we need to gather all of our terms onto one side. We traditionally do the left-hand side and therefore have the right-hand side equal zero. Is there a common factor? No. Now, this is the technique which I'm assuming you've done before. Sometimes we call it the AC method, which is where term one, oh, term one, two, and three. So the coefficient of x squared is a, the coefficient of the x is b, and the, co the constant term on the end is c. So the AC method is where you multiply them together and to see what you get. So AC, if you like, is negative 6. I sometimes do this off to the side. And then you're often looking for pairs that multiply to give you negative 6, but add to give the, the middle term the negative 5. Because if you once you get your brackets, if you were to expand them out, this is what it would fact, um, expand out to and the like terms would collect. In my head first, I don't worry too much about the negative. I just start thinking of the pairs. This is an interesting one, though, because the factors that could times together to give you 6 might be um, 1 and 6 and 2 and 3. Well, how do they add to give negative 5, though? You'd need to have negative 2 and negative 3. This is negative 2x and negative 3x, technically. But what do they multiply to give? They actually multiply to give a positive 6. So that's not going to work. To have it where it's a negative 6 um, in this term here, the constant term, that means only one of the factors can be negative. And that's why this one up here, the first pair is going to work. To get negative 5, we would need to start with a positive 1 and subtract off 6. So there are pairs that we're going to write here. I hope you followed me in that factorizing. Then we're using the null factor law to set both, um, t uh, no, they're not terms, both of the products there, the factors, equal to 0. So you, you might like to start with a therefore put each term equal to 0, and then rearrange to solve for x. So x is equal to negative 1 or 6. And you can always check this by substituting one or both of those terms back in and seeing if you get the left-hand side equaling the right-hand side, or 
in that first line, it all equaling the zero there. Next, so let's rearrange these to have all of our terms on the left hand side and having them in descending powers of x. So then that helps us to factorize. Now you could be using the AC method again, or you need to be on the lookout for some of those special properties that we have perfect squares and dots, the difference of two squares. And this one is one of those. You've, we've got the four um, as the coefficient of x squared and a one here, and they're perfect numbers. And so this is one where it would factorize to be the same bracket twice. And we're looking then at the square root of four to give us two, and also then the square root of x squared to give us a single x. And the square root of one is one. And then you have to decide, is it a positive or a negative number going in the middle around here? Well, we ended up with negative four. So that means it would be a negative there. If you're not sure about that, you could always expand out to check and now we solve for x. So the first step we actually have to do is undo the square there. So we have to square root zero, if you like, which leaves us with um, just zero. We don't have to worry about the plus or minus in this case. And then rearranging, solving for x, and x is a half. So just a single answer there to make this equation true. So the, there's only one root or one solution to this equation. Next one, let's rearrange to get all of the terms on the left. Okay, this one's a little bit um, more work because we've got a six as the coefficient of x squared. So let's think about that AC method there. Um, you could be listing off the factors of 60 where you've got uh, 10 times by six there and you might list off your pairs, things like two and 15, three and 20, four and 15, five and 12. However, that would be much simpler if we didn't have the six there. So if the um, the constant term was 60 on its own. So this technique might have to go to the side. The technique that I was taught when I was in year 10 by my maths teacher is then, how do I explain it? I It's to do with the cross multiplying method. And so I'm gonna split that six. We traditionally do, it's often not left as six. It's often going to be a, a three X and a two X. I'm just gonna write it this way around and there's a 3x. And so essentially what I'm going to be writing here are the two brackets that we'll end up with, but the terms in each of them will be cross multiplied with the opposite one. Let me try and explain that to you. So then we're looking at two things that multiply to give the negative 10. I'm thinking two and five. So let's try that first. What if we had a two here and a five here? Now, which combination of positives and negatives? So to give us negative 10, we need one of them to be negative. And then what we have to do is consider this cross multiplying, because if we were to write those brackets out next to each other, they're the terms that would multiply together. So what have we got here? We've got a 2x multiplied by a 5 would give a 10x, and then 2 multiplied by 3x gives us a 6x. Obviously, we'd need to make one of them negative. Is any combination of that, though, going to end us up with 11, negative 11? Probably not. Let me try you another, show you another pair. Um, I'll just do that under, no, I'll do it off to the side here. Hopefully I've got enough room. So we've got 2x and a 3x. What about if we switch the five and the two? So put the five up in that bracket and the two down here. When we're multiplying these together, we would have a 4x here and a 15x. Ah, I reckon there's a combination of 15 and four there that would end up with negative 11x. So if we started with a positive four and and subtracted off 15 would be at negative 11. So the positive four means we must put a plus there and to have negative 15, the negative goes with the negative five there. So there are two brackets. It doesn't matter which order you then write them in. If you're not sure, you could always expand out and check. And then we use the null factor law, putting each bracket equal to zero and solving for X. So there are two answers for this. These are our, our roots or our solutions. X is equal to five on two or negative two on three. This one here, a little bit of rearranging first because we've got X as a denominator. So we want to multiply through by X. So each term gets multiplied through. The two on X now just becomes a two. And the other term is going to be negative seven X. But then I also now want to rearrange that to have uh, all the terms on the left-hand side. 
being careful with your signs there. Okay, now we need to use the AEC method again, or this sort of cross multiplication. So the way I like to set it up is to start trying to imagine the brackets that I'm going to get. One bracket will have a 3x in it, and one will have an x. And then I need to split that 2 into its factors to see how it would multiply. I can already see that, well, I'll do the wrong one for you first. If it was positive 2 and a 1, positive 1, and you cross multiply that, you would have a 3x coming from there and a 2x coming from the other multiplication, that's only 5x. So that one's not going to be right. So I can already see the, that the 2 and the 1 need to go the other way around, so that when you cross multiply, that gives you a 6x, and that gives you um, a single x, and the 6x plus x gives you 7, and so there are two brackets. 3x plus 1 and x plus 2 is equal to 0, and solving for x. Now I suppose at this level of maths that you're at, you are welcome to start skipping a few steps, so you're welcome to do the null factor law sort of in one go, but making sure you do show as many steps as you feel is necessary. You might need to check with your teacher on that one. Last bit here, um, just a caution if you like. A classic error that students sometimes make when they're solving for x is thinking, oh, x is a common factor, I can divide through by that, right? No, you can't. You can if it was a number. So consider this one here. Uh, the in, well, I'll show you the correct solution. So we would rearrange to make one side equal to zero. You take out a common factor and then apply the null factor law to get um, these two values here, zero or five. The null factor law means you have to have something being null, being zero, to apply the null factor law. So here, an incorrect solution would be this, where people think, oh, I'm going to divide through by x. It's okay if you think that. It's a really common mistake to make while you're still learning. And so people cross them out and go, oh, okay, we've got x is equal to just 5 then. That's one of the solutions, but you've now discounted the other one. So that's a classic trap to that people fall into, so beware of that one. The next video in this series will be completing the square. Please uh, like the video and subscribe to the channel and share it with somebody else that might need help with this stuff too. Thank you.